Hi guys, I am here with the amazing Tanya today. Tanya, hi, how are you? I'm good, Jade. How are you? Thank you for chatting with me today. Uh, <laughs> you're so welcome. I can't wait to hear all the things that you've got to say. So, in lockdown, it's become quite common for us, especially British, um, obviously Tanya's from Canada, um, it's been very, very common for us to start drinking more. So we're going to talk a little bit about alcohol and hopefully not put too much nerve or dampener on people's parties. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. So we're going to focus on what alcohol actually does to your body. Um, do you want to kind of kick off, Tanya? Yeah, sure. I grew up in a family that had a lot of alcoholism. So when I was younger... Younger and trying to like much maybe like yourself, you know, trying to sort of get to be popular. I drank a lot, but I found it was very hard on me and I actually couldn't do it. So, you know, I wonder if we should even just start off if people know what is really in their drinks, right? Because for many of us, it's part of the daily routine, especially in lockdown. It's so easy. I hear from my friends to just pour a glass of wine. You're not going anywhere. I'm sure we can all relate to that one, right? Especially when it's sunny and you look outside and you think, oh, I might just open a beer. And then you look at your clock and it's 10 a.m. and you're like, well, lockdown rules, right? <laughs> Are there any with lockdown? <laughs> yeah, oh I think gosh. find out what actually is in your drink might be a really, really good place to start. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if we think about it too much, right? So, like, what's the deal with booze and what's in it? It is an energy dense beverage, depending on what you're drinking. So, beer, wine, hard liquor, it, uh, depending on what you're drinking, can contain a lot of sugar. So wine will contain sugar, but the main component of it is ethanol. And so ethanol or ethyl alcohol is in many things besides what we're drinking. And you know, when we think of alcohol right now, I think of hand sanitizer because it does have ethanol, antiseptic properties. It's a disinfectant, antibacterial, and antifungal. So, you know, sounds good. Maybe it's cleaning out these microbes while we're putting them, putting alcohol in our gut. All of but your no, gut bacteria. It doesn't. Oh, the gut bacteria, yeah, or your gut lining. Um, it's also in medications that can't be dissolved in alcohol. And it's added to fuel here in North America. So it reduces carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxide emissions in the fuel. And then I just was like, yeah, and we drink that. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Tasty. Tasty is right. It's generally produced by fermentation or distillation. And from what I mean, I know about reading before, um, alcohol, you know, the more you spend, you do get a better product because it goes through more of a distillation process. And so that's a whole other thing. You know, what toxins can even be in alcohol? When you think of wine, it's one of the more heavily sprayed crops. And you're not just having your grapes, you're having things that impact your nervous system, but things that impact your gut too. Hmm. So you mean it's not one of my five a day? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Half your plate with wine. Isn't that, I don't know if you have that here with a half the plate of vegetables, right? Just a little soup bowl of wine. No, it, <laughs> it's not your five a day. The grapes might be, but not the wine. And you know, I don't know where it's like where you are, but what about like the marketing of wine to women? Do you see how that yeah. plays out? That's so it's interesting. really interesting because in the UK, I'm sure you have something similar where you guys are. We have like Weight Watchers wine, we have Skinny really? Cow wine, we oh, have yeah. all the things that are targeted at being low calorie wine. And you know that the reason why they're targeting low calorie is to try and target women specifically because women are seen more as wine drinkers and men are seen more as beer drinkers. And you know, every time you do see an advert for wine, it's always a woman, usually in some very formal wear or a very, very nice tight dress drinking wine in a hot day. Um, yeah. So wine, how bad is it for us? Do we want to know? Probably not, but we're going to tell you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, women and alcohol are different than men and alcohol. So when we talk mm. about wine and beer, women and men, we have different effects, you know, we have less water and that can affect the way we detoxify wine. And so is it bad for us? There's some research, ugh, some research that says possibly for the most part, yes, depending on your amount. 
but it also depends on the person, right? So I think when we think about good and bad, whether it's, you know, where I stand with the food labels, good and bad. If we look at wine, good and bad, how are you as a person, right? How do you feel after having wine? What other chronic conditions do you have? Are you, are you over drinking? Are you an addictive personality? Women have less water in their bodies to be able to dilute the alcohol in their bloodstream. We have higher concentrations. Women aren't going to want to hear this one. We have higher concentrations of adipose tissue. It's just normal as women, but this produces slower alcohol absorption in women than in men. And we lack or have less of, I lack this enzyme I found out later in life, like two ants of mine. Um, we have less of a particular enzyme in our liver that's called ADH or alcohol dehydrogenase. And that is what metabolizes the booze. And so when you lack that, you can feel a lot crappier. In the general scheme of things though, when you think of drinking and women's health, and when we think of perimenopause and menopause, what are the top complaints you hear, Jade? What do you hear about? Moods, anxiety. Um, yeah, definitely anxiety, mood, pelvic floor problems, but that's, well, if you drink enough, you will have problems with that. Um, and like hot flashes and things like that. Um, and it's also true that depending on where you are in your cycle can actually affect how intoxicated you get as well because of the levels of estrogen that's in your body. Um, so of course, as females, if you are going through perimenopause and menopause and you are having issues and you are drinking, this is going to massively ag ag aggravate your symptoms. I couldn't speak for a minute then. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Well, that's interesting how you say pelvic floor too, because you and I both have different information about the pelvic floor. And when I think of the pelvic floor, I might be thinking of it differently than you do. But um, when you think of alcohol's effect on the nervous system and i think of the pelvic floor and how it's innervated when you think of its effect on muscle relaxation mm. i think of the pelvic floor that's so interesting i'd love to hear more of what you're saying about that too yeah i mean there's also the fact that alcohol can aggravate the bladder yeah. uh, of course when you are drunk you might not necessarily be paying attention to your body so you might not be listening to when your bladder is full or you might be going to the toilet more frequently and opening and closing your pelvic floor more than perhaps you need to. Um, and if you are waiting until your bladder is really, really full, um, that puts a lot more pressure on your pelvic floor and that's when you can experience more leakage. You know, there's just so much to it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. That's like a whole other talk. <laughs> I know. We'd be here for like hours if we started talking about that. <laughs> right. Okay. So let's go with the negative effects on the body, right? Um, a CNS depressant, we talked about that a little bit. So it depresses the central nervous system. And so if we are suffering with depression and anxiety, which can mount during perimenopause and menopause, maybe the booze, although it feels like the right thing if you're having three ounces of wine, which is roughly a serving, I've heard three to five. So when you go to the restaurant here and you're like supersized with the nine ounce glass, but not that we can go to the restaurant right now, but we're really having like three servings of wine in a glass when you think about it, right? And that alcohol is slowing that brain action and reaction time in our bodies, it irritates the gut and the liver. As you said, it irritates the bladder. And do we not forget that it's classified as a carcinogen, right? It's classified as a carcinogen. Of course. And another thing is when you, when you are drinking from home, you're, you never, I mean, speaking from personal experience, you never measure out, let's say what, 175 milliliters or whatever, you pour until the glass is about that far away from the top. And that's easily like, three servings like you said in one yeah. glass and how quick do you go through that one glass and then fill it up again and again so you're not even really kind of aware of how much you're drinking from personal experience <laughs> no no that's so true and after that first glass you let's face it we also can feel i don't know about you but i can feel now that i'm in my 50s the effects of alcohol like that so it just hits me. And if I drink it too fast, I'm not really paying attention to how much is poured into the next glass, right? Who cares? Give me the next glass. Exactly. And not only that, but it starts to affect, like you said, your brain function. It starts to release happy hormones, then you want more and more and more and more and more. And of course, that just leads to more and more and more problems. No, but it's true. You know, when we talk about 
hormonal health, we're forgetting women want to attack hormonal health and menopausal belly fat and all of this stuff by dieting. But what, where is all the hormones coming from and where are they being controlled? Right? The nervous system. And so when we're filling the nervous system with alcohol, and I think you would agree, we're not saying like, don't ever drink again. It's really the knowledge and the power to make some decisions for yourself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, let's talk about going back to what's in booze and how it affects your body. Let's talk about what happens with that one glass. So let's just say if someone has one glass at night, what happens with that one glass? Is it enough to notice a difference with your body or would you have to drink more than one glass for it to have an effect? Again, I think that depends on the person, but let's, let's break this down a little bit. Let's think about having that one glass of wine. What if we had that one glass of wine under a stressful situation, which is a lot of the time when we're having that. When we're stressed, we don't have digestive juices flowing. We don't have digestion turned on. The wine will get absorbed through the bloodstream, but what is it doing to the gut that's already under stress? It undermines the lining of the gut. And if there's sugar, it can feed any fungal issues, candida in the gut. So the next morning, if we've had one or two, how do you feel? Are you waking up feeling tired and groggy? Are you dehydrated? And are you looking for <laughs> greasy food? Because it's counterproductive. That alcohol leads to blood sugar swings, even a little bit, you know? We're thinking of putting sugar in our body with wine, blood sugar swings. It impairs absorption of B vitamins, which we need for detox processes. We need to feed our stressed adrenals. We need for so many reasons, for, for so many reasons. But it also has an effect on um, fatty acid production in the liver as well. So is there, because this is probably the question that everyone's thinking, is there a type of alcohol that is best to drink? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I would say yes and no. If we really, really need our drinks, we do want to look for things that are more distilled than others, organic wine. And then it sounds like I'm a wine snob because there's lots of wonderful wines that are $9 or under nine pounds, $9 here in, the, uh, in Canada. Um, so yes, there's a difference in what you drink, but it all contains ethanol. And so even with relating to the nutrients, the best way of eating will never negate the effects of ethanol completely. It affects every system of your body, every cell. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Alcohol is really not great for you kids. <laughs> um, are there any studies that you've looked at that have looked at let's say um, alcohol going through perimenopause and alcohol going through menopause or any experience with your private clients? The studies that I've seen and with women that I talk to, you know what, I find the alcohol and the coffee are the two things that women are the most resistant, right? Women, it's the coping mechanism. It's almost the, um, you know, like wired and tired response with the coffee and the wine. But the most research does not support alcohol when it comes to perimenopause, menopause, and women in general. There is a, a huge, huge, vast amount of research that links alcohol to breast cancer because it does raise estrogen potential. And again, depending on what you read in the studies, it depends on how much you're drinking, how often in the week, how often you're giving your body a break, or whether or not you carry those genes as risk anyways. Interesting though, I did find a study that supports minimal amounts of alcohol in menopausal or postmenopausal women because of the estrogen potential of the alcohol and it helps Ooh. with bone this was one and it wasn't just one study it was like a meta-analysis and i thought okay that's interesting but do we give mixed messages because again there's positive benefits to alcohol relaxation vasodilation so we have less risk of certain heart attacks. And a lot of the studies have been done in men though. There's not a lot in women. So there is that positive benefit of alcohol, but then again, it's the threshold. Well, how much is going to put me over the edge? Yeah, absolutely. It's also worth talking about, as you mentioned, breast cancer and estrogen before. A lot of it does also come down to BMI. You know, the higher you have your BMI, the more at risk you are from breast cancer. So it isn't just this one factor. Like if you are drinking on a regular basis, you know, it's not that one thing that will cause ill health. It is 
how your entire lifestyle is. You know, if you're eating well, you're exercising and your genetics are pretty good, then and you enjoy the odd glass of wine, then sure, go ahead. But if your lifestyle is pretty terrible and you're not looking after your gut bacteria, and I'm gonna also gonna mention teeth, because I know that you are big on your teeth. Um, it's not great for your teeth either. I mean, alcohol, wine, acid, it affects your gums and your teeth as well, doesn't it? Well, yes, directly and indirectly. So, um, you know, Jade, I've just mentioned that I am a dental hygienist besides being a holistic nutritionist in case your viewers are thinking, who is this woman? Why is she obsessed with teeth? <laughs> uh, and that's when I get out of, out of lockdown. Just me when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. I have braces on still. I'm wearing Invisalign, so I can't wait to get them off. But anyway, um, indirectly and directly, yes. So it changes the pH of the mouth and the body, but it's also a diuretic. So you're not just drinking the wine you're decreasing your saliva because you're peeing all the time and out with that pee comes your minerals your calcium your magnesium all the minerals that support neurotransmitters in the brain but also your bone and so you how many of us don't drink enough water before bed we go to bed with an acidy mouth and that can affect your tooth enamel but conversely if you brush right after the wine and don't let your saliva mineralize your teeth you're also brushing off soft tooth enamel. It's sort of, again, a catch-22. That is a catch-22, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> so you got to wait for an hour before you go to bed and then brush your teeth after your wine, after pub night. I was going to say, can you imagine everyone sitting at home quite drunk after quite a few wines thinking, Tanya said that I need to wait like at least an, an hour and with the acid, just all sobering up in that hour. <laughs> That's right. Or just have some cheese, just neutralize with some cheese. <laughs> which is not so great for your gut either, but it is delicious, isn't it? Oh, cheese is so good. And I'm lactose intolerant, so. Oh, gosh. Yeah, but life's too short. So um, what else do you want to touch on when it comes to booze and women and menopause and all those other things? And really just keeping in mind that every time we do have a drink, we are trading off nutrients because there's two things that happen. Yes, it depletes your body of nutrients, but there's the inhibitory factor when you're drinking, what, what do you want to eat? And I don't mean eating in the sense of bad foods. It's the competition of nutrients because we tend to go for the things that may not be feeding ourselves. We want to have things like chips or fried foods. And then we can just feel awful mentally because women still place that guilt on themselves. But even in our guts, we're not feeding the gut bacteria. We can just feel crappy with the choices that we make. And that's actually an interesting thing. You know, maybe instead of thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to leave this little webinar and stop drinking, start paying attention to how you feel. How do you feel in the morning after you have a drink? How do you feel? How much, how much uh, energy do you have when you wake up? Yeah, absolutely. And I also think sometimes drinking becomes a habit. So like we joked about in lockdown, when it comes to the end of the working day, people have kind of got into that habit of, I finished, I'll have a drink as a kind of a relaxation thing. So I think sometimes it's also about breaking that habit. And, you know, when you get that craving for a drink, do you do something else? Do you break the feedback loop? You know, there's, there's lots of things that you can do without actually reaching for a drink. And I know that sounds very um, health nutish, but there's a lot that you can do, right? <laughs> Actually, I don't think it sounds health nutish because from my perspective in working with people who have emotional eating issues and who just feel that this emotional eating thing is really bad right now too, when you think of mindful or intuitive eating approaches to food, you can use that for alcohol. So if you can create a space between the action, taking the drink and the craving, wanting the drink, and sort of sit with it for a little bit and ask yourself, what am I really looking for? Am I lonely? Because a lot of us, when you think of women, when we go out together to have wine night, it's belonging, right? What's the yeah. sense of belonging? So are you lonely? Are you stressed? Are you angry? Are you looking to bring that stress down or dissipate that anger? And is there anything else that you can do? And I mean, that's a muscle, I think, that is uh, something that needs to be exercised. But the more we do that, and actually, it's like anything else, we allow ourselves to feel what we're feeling, because we, I think, as a whole, globally, cut ourselves off from emotion, then you could make a different choice. Perfect. And if people want more of you, where do they go to get more of what you do? 
They're welcome to follow me on Instagram, which is currently at Mind Meat Food. I hang out on my personal Facebook page, but I do have a business page and it's under my name. Both of them are under my name and I do have a group for conscious eaters as well. But I love to chat anywhere and I do pin a few things on Pinterest, I will say. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Any last words before we wrap this up? No, I think it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. I think together we can really dig into a little more of this alcohol talk because I'm interested in hearing more about the pelvic floor as well. A hundred percent. Well, we will have you back on the page very, very soon. But otherwise, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Jade.